so the rich man will, will fade away in his pursuit. You know, what I want to tell you what I really think these, these three verses talk about is we need to trust in something of eternal value. <laughs> Amen? You and I need to learn to trust in th- with something in eternal value. Here in James chapter 9, James is letting the followers of Christ know it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, okay? The common denominator needs to be Jesus. Amen? It doesn't matter for rich or poor, the common denominator is in Jesus, okay? If Christ dwells in our heart by faith, how much we have or how little we have, possessions or lack of them mean very little in the long run. You know that? What we have really in the long run means very little, okay? James is letting us know as Christians our greatest possession as a man or a woman, as a child of God, is Jesus, is our possession. Now, we live in a culture where they're constantly bombarding us with everything, saying you can never be satisfied with what you have. But Jesus says you can be satisfied, okay? It's kind of interesting. In the first century, uh, Judaism had become very exclusive. Worse yet, they were proudly bigots, okay? And their relationship to outsiders, and even amongst Jewish believers themselves, there was this pecking order. I want us to go over to Matthew. We're gonna, I'm just going to read some verses here to show you this. Over in Matthew chapter 9, you know, that's why... They didn't like Jesus a lot. He came and he up. He not only uh, threw up the uh, the tables in the tavern or in the in the temple. He upset their pecking order too. Over in Matthew chapter nine, we're going to go verse nine. It says, "As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me.' So he rose and he followed him. Now, a little background: tax collectors were the most despised people." in the Jewish culture. You know why? Because tax collectors were Jews, but tax collectors were working for and with the Roman government. Then the Jews looked at the Roman government as an oppressive government. So you were working for the people that were oppressing you. And plus a tax collector, how he actually made his living many times is let's say for instance, uh, Roxy owed $10 in taxes. If I could extract from her $20, I got to keep the difference. Okay, and I could threaten maybe to throw her in jail if she didn't give me that $20. And so remember this. So tax collectors were not the cream of the crop. It says, now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in Matthew's house, that behold, many other tax collectors came, okay, and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Can you imagine that? Jesus sitting with sinners, okay? Turn to your, turn to your neighbor and say, you're in good company, hallelujah, Okay. You're in good company, okay? And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You know what these do? You know what the Pharisees, a couple things the Pharisees are trying to do. You know what the Pharisees were trying to do right here? They were trying to cause division, number one, with Jesus and his disciples. But number two, they were trying to say they were better than those people, okay? I want us to go over to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We're seeing how at the first century it was a very exclusive club, so to speak, okay? And you know what? I've always told people this. We in in churches, we need to make sure we don't get into our own little holy huddles. What is a holy huddle? Us four, no more. Do you understand what I'm saying? Make, Make sure you reach out to other people around you. You know what? You're always going to see your family every day if you have family here. And it's wonderful to go and sit by them and be with them. It's fun to talk to your friends, but you're always going to do that. Make sure you get out of your own little holy huddle, so to speak, and get around and visit all the people, okay? Over in Luke chapter 18, we're going to go verses 9 through 14. This is a, par- par- this is a, fair- a parable to Pharisees and the tax collector. And he said, and also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So who's Jesus talking to? The self-righteous people. The ones that thought they were better than somebody else. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. We know a little bit about the tax collector, don't we now? The Pharisees thought they were better. 
the Pharisee stood and prayed that, uh, that prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you, I am not like this other man, an extortioner, extortioner unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector. Wouldn't you like to be praying next to that guy? Lord, thank you for not making me like my neighbor. Okay, you, you know how self-righteous you have to be? I mean, it's one thing to think it, another to pray it out loud. So we're finding out in the first century, see, this is the kind of attitude that James is combating here in the first century, okay? I, and then, then he goes on to say what he does. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Are you starting to find out how there is a prejudice here that James is dealing with? And now let's go over to John, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We're going we're gonna to read verses 45 through 49. John chapter 7, verses 45 through 49. Okay, it says, Then the officers came to the chief priests, the Pharisees, and said to them, Who, uh, Why have you not brought him? This is, they went to arrest Jesus. Now, you've got to remember, the, the officers of the temple, they might have worked for the Roman government, but Rome was such an, a, a, such an expansive kingdom, they didn't have enough Roman soldiers to go everywhere. So what they would do is they would hire locals to be part of the Roman soldiers there. And so many, most scholars will tell you that the, many of the soldiers that were around the temple were actually Jews that were hired to be soldiers for the Roman government. The officers answered, said, no man has ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered, who? To the Roman soldiers who were actually Jews, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. What were they telling these soldiers? They, you're a bunch of nincompoops. That's what they're really saying. They're saying, you don't know the law. You're not spiritual. I've gone to seminary. I've gone to Bible school. I, now, there's nothing wrong with those things. I think if you want to go into ministry, they're great places to go. But he's saying, just because you have the education doesn't qualify you as somebody that's better than anybody else. You know, we watched a movie the other night, and it really struck me. And it was a movie, what was it about different? What is it? It, it was a movie on Netflix about everyone is different. And it was, about, it was about in the South and how there was a doctor in the South and his wife, and they, they, helped find, or they helped a rescue mission. And there was a black man there named Denver. Yes, it was. Thank you. So that's why I brought Marilyn with me today. Okay? Denver. And what was amazing is Denver was homeless, and people would just walk right by him, and they wouldn't even hardly recognize him. And then the, the, the doctor's wife ended up with cancer. She ended up dying. And it was amazing in life that that Denver spoke at, at, at her funeral. And, and he said something that struck my heart. He said, you know what? Everybody's homeless here. You know, all of us are homeless here today. Because the Bible says this is not our home. Heaven is our home. So we're all really staying in a, in a rescue mission. You might call it your house, do you understand? But according to the Bible, we're all homeless here. Because my home is in heaven. Jesus is making a mansion for us. And so we need to really look like, and I think if we would all look at ourselves as homeless, maybe when we saw someone else that didn't have an earthly home to go to, maybe we would never think, I'm glad I'm not like them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because in essence, we are all really homeless. See, James was letting his audience, which consisted of uh, fulfilled or messianic Jews, known as Christians, not to show their partiality based on wealth and possessions. We're going to talk about later on in James. James says, hey, when the rich man comes in the church, don't, we must not have like Carl Ann and Marilyn and, and uh, uh, Charmaine, uh, Charmaine, they must be the only rich ones here. Because it says when the rich guy comes in the church, don't parade him up to the front row and set him here and say, you sit up here at front. No. 
He said, don't show partiality. See, it doesn't matter if you have money or you're not. It doesn't matter if you have possessions or not. You know what matters is that you have Jesus in your heart. That's what really matters in life, okay? And James is telling these people that, okay? Why would God's Spirit press this message upon James's heart? Because in Genesis 1.26, it says, we were all made in the likeness of God, and thus we should treat everybody with dignity and respect. You look at what it says in Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What is James telling us? That what? We're all made in the likeness of God. You know what? Some are a little darker, some are a little lighter, some are a little richer, some are a little poorer. Some might have a lot, some might have a little. It really doesn't matter in life because we are all made in the image of God. And wasn't that really the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength, and do unto others as you like others to do unto you. Treat people with dignity and respect. In verse 10, it says here in James 1, But the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat that then it withers the grass, it, the flower fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuit. The rich man is, is tempted to exalt himself according to his, his earthly trapping, trappings. James is telling the rich to let go of the shadow and grasp for the substance. What really makes you and I rich? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. You know, I got a phone call from somebody yesterday and that Charmaine knows real well, attended the church in India, or in uh, Arizona, and a little boy, Tristan, he'd had seizures. And here they had his funeral for him yesterday. Eight years old. Oh, eight years old, died. And you know what? And, and Luke, his father, uh, was a good man. His grandmother, Patty, they brought him to church as much as they could. And he'd had surgeries and all this in Phoenix and everything, and everything was going good. And then it seemed like he was on the road to recovery, and he had a seizure, and everything went south from there. And you know what? There's a, there's a hole in that man's heart for a son, but I want you to know, Tristan today is walking on streets of gold. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I'm telling you what, Tristan, was, you know, maybe he wanted the Batman toys and all the little uh, Marvel toys, but I tell you what, now he grasps something of true value in heaven, and we need to realize that, you know, there's nothing wrong with having things in life, folks. There's nothing. I'm not going to tell you to sell everything and, and all these things. I'm not going to tell you, but just make sure you have the things and the things don't have you. Amen? Make sure you have things and the things don't have you. And if you really want to know, could you give that away? Could you give that away? I don't, there's some things that got me. I'm not going to lie, okay? But so there's some things God's working on my heart about. Because you know what? I don't want anything to get in the way of what Jesus might ask me to do. And he may never ask us to give it all away. That's okay. And chances are he never will, but at least be willing if we ask. Amen? Look at what it says in Proverbs 23.5. Proverbs 23.5 says, Will you set your eyes on that which is not? It says don't covet. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They will fly away like an eagle towards heaven. You ever met anybody that was rich once and now they're poor? I'm sure you have. You know what? Those riches are like wings. They just flew away. Okay? And like I said here, James is telling us that wealth and riches and possessions are not bad. He's telling us that we, but what he's telling us is we're not owners of these things. We may have them for a season, and then you know what? After you and I leave this earth, you know what's going to happen? Somebody else is going to take over them. You know, does that make sense? I mean, we think we own things. We really don't own anything. Because when we die, somebody else is going to grab it. You know that old 2004 <coughs> purple truck I got? You know, someday, if I die, if I still have the thing, somebody else is going to get it. I don't know who. Okay, who wants it? Okay, maybe, but all the things we have. And you know what's amazing? You know, I, I, Meryl and I talk about this. You know, 
kids nowadays, they don't like antiques or anything like that. You know, they don't want anything wood. They want something from Ikea that's press board, hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? You know, we have all these things in our house that we've accumulated over 40 plus years. And we ask our kids, you know, when, hey, would you like any of these things when we're gone? Nope, don't want a blessed thing you got. You know what? They're just things. I remember, I've told you several times when my grandfather Albert, when he sold his farm and he had a beautiful home and, and a year or two afterwards the home was kind of decrepit, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the porch had been fallen in and had been taken off. And I asked Grandpa once, I said, doesn't that bother you? I never forgot. He said, no, the check cleared. The check cleared. It's not mine anymore. And see, really, we don't own anything, okay? See, we have it for a season then someone else will possess it. And you know what? Maybe you can give it to your kids, to people, and they'll never treat it the way you treated it either. Okay? See, riches will fly away and wither away. See, everybody doesn't have to go and sell everything they have and live in poverty. James is telling us, though, not to wrap our life around the temporal at the expense of the eternal. I can say that again. Let's not wrap ourselves around the temporal at the expense of the eternal. Because the temporal is going to come and go. Amen. The temporal can be quickly gone, but God's blessings are for eternity. For some people, poverty may be a trial, while others, prosperity may be a trial. Each one of these, prosperity or poverty, carries their own conditions and their own unique challenges. Look what it says in Saul or in Proverbs 30, Proverbs 30, verse 8. Proverbs 30, verse 8. You know, I've heard people say, well, if I had more money. You know what, folks? Sometimes money can be a problem. Sometimes a lack of money is a problem, okay? Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Least I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or least I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. What was the proverb writer saying? Don't give me too much that I forget about you or too, much, or too little that I curse you. And isn't that really come along in the Lord's Prayer? What does the Lord's Prayer say? Get our daily bread. Come on. And God's saying, you know what? Be happy with what you have now. It's very, very important. Each of these, each of these conditions, poverty and, and prosperity, brings with it blessings and burdens. And James is letting his fellow believers in Christ know that whether you're rich in this world's possessions or not, each person through God's grace can rise to equally great attainment in the spirit and in unity of life. What's he saying there? It doesn't matter if you don't have two cents or you got 102 cents. You can obtain the same thing with Christ. It doesn't matter. Your riches aren't going to disqualify you, and they're not going to get you any closer. It's all about One day I was talking to Casey on the phone, and we were ch- talking a little bit. And I remember we, I made a comment, I think, to Casey. Or he said it back to me, and he said, you know, what we try to do here at Christ, and we make it all about Jesus. We make it all about Jesus. Because you know what? All those other things are going to come and go in this world. But Jesus is going to remain the same. Amen? Riches can never be the measuring rod to determine if someone is more spiritual than others. Have you ever been around somebody and say, <clears throat> They really love God because they have a lot. Come on. You know, there are some Christian circles that they judge how close you are to God by how much money you have. And I've met some people in Jamaica and Haiti and around the world where I've been at that they love Jesus with all their heart, their soul and strength and all within them, and they have a grass hut with a mud floor. And what an insult to say that because I have a house with shingles and a wood floor that I love Jesus more than they do because I happen to have more. See, in the book of James, the first century Christians, they were judging, saying, if you have a lot, you must be really spiritual. And you know what, folks? Drive through Beverly Hills in Hollywood and see what they all have for earthly possessions. And you'll find out there's not a lot of spiritual things going on there. Amen? See, folks, James is letting us know whether rich or poor, God is for us. Riches can never be that measuring rod, okay? It is, what's our measuring rod? It's a life 
that's lived out over the long run. It never lies. You know, your life never lies. You know, sometimes, have you ever gone to a funeral and they're talking about this person? You think, who are they talking about? This isn't the guy that I knew all those years. Who are they talking about? You know, because you know their life wasn't lying. They might be lying up front in the pulpit, but that life isn't lying. And so we need to make sure that we're living a life out because our life doesn't lie. Look what it says over in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. It's right next to James. Just go forward one book, okay? Or two books. One, I think. It says in James, and Peter 1, 17 through 19. It says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. What's he really, what's, what's Peter telling us? God is looking at what we're doing in life, okay? I don't know about you, but it's kind of fearful to think I'm going to fall in the hands of a, on a just and a holy God. Now, maybe that doesn't bother you. You guys are all okay. Go for it, okay? Hallelujah. Sometimes I just have a hard time coming and telling my wife the truth, hallelujah, okay? Let alone God, okay? It says here in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with, we sing about it, but with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish and without spot. See, folks, that's what counts. I've been redeemed. You got a new truck, a new car, I'm happy for you. But are you redeemed? You know, I got money to bank, I'm happy for you. But are you redeemed? My kid made the winning shot or the, the winning putt. That's wonderful. But is your child redeemed? See, it's all about the redeemed of the Lord. And you know what I love? And the redeemed of the Lord said so. So all the redeemed say so. So. Yeah, that's the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yes. See, that's what we need to focus on. You know, this fall, you know, we'll be watching that the Indians playing football, and I'm hoping Austin takes off for an 80-yard touchdown run, and I'll be cheering for him all the way. But you know what? You know what's going to throw me the most is I know Austin has Jesus in his heart. Because you know what? I got news for you. That touchdown run's going to be long forgotten, okay? It will. Somebody else is going to come along and do something. But you know what? I'll always know that he's a born-again Christian. That's what matters in life. And that's what James is saying. Don't let all these earthly trappings, earthly trappings are not evil in themselves. Uh, What we have in this world is amoral or neutral. It's how we choose to use them. But don't let these things get us. And look what it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Romans 8, 16 and 17. It says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. There's going to be some suffering. Remember James said, when you fall into diverse temptation, when you have trials, you know what, though? What you and I are going through in this world, we're going to, we're going to have some good times in heaven, too, because of that. See, the false glory of this world, the glitter, the gold, the pride, and the power, Those are the false glories of this world. James is telling us, beware of pride on one side and envy on the other. You know, I tell you what, though, I've I've gone, you know, anybody ever been up in Ron's shop? If you have, man, when I walk in that shop, or or Tom, he has a lot of tools, too. I'm telling you, I have to walk through a decoveting room after I go through their house, okay? Okay. Because they got tools in there I really covet a lot. They that you know, what what do you do with them? I don't know, but they just look cool, Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? You know, just to turn it on and hear the hum of that engine. Mm, and you can what does it do? I don't know, but man, I got it. You know what I'm saying? Girls, don't Allison look at me and think that is weird. No, no. You look at shoes, okay, and dresses and makeup and all these other things too. Okay, hallelujah. But you, do you understand what I'm saying? And, you know, and we just ought to make sure that we don't envy what other people have. In fact, I think it's great that Tom has all those tools because I can borrow them and I didn't have to buy them, hallelujah, okay? <laughs> That's what his boys have been doing for years, haven't they, Tom? Come on, okay? <laughs> we don't envy it. We're happy about it, hallelujah. <clears throat> you know, 
God is, James is telling us through the Lord's Spirit, don't be envious of those things. Be happy for that person. Because you know what? We don't know what they had to go through to get those things. And it's really, really important. May it be all, all of us that our goal in life is to truly possess the prize of Christ. You know, it says in Ephesians 2, 7 at the end, the exceeding riches of his grace through Christ Jesus. You know what I want for you? You know what I want for me? You know what I want for our families, for our kids? I want us to possess the exceeding riches of his grace in our lives. That's what I want. You know, we were on that song, I think it was Matt Redman, 10,000 Reasons. And at the end it says, when the evening has come, let me be singing. You know what that to me is? That's about when somebody gets to the end of their life, I want to be singing to Jesus. I want to be thanking him for all that he has done for me in my life. Has it all been a bed of roses? No, there's thorns and roses, but you got a nice aroma too. Hallelujah. And so you know what God is saying? You know what? Maybe you and I are going through some trials today. That's okay. That's okay. You know what? Maybe you're, you're a little short in the cash. You know, I tell people, Merrill and I, we were, never, we were never poor. We just had some cash flow problems, okay? <laughs> we were waiting for the cash flow to kick in a little bit, you know? But, you know, the fact of the matter is God has taken care of us, and he's taken care of you. And you know what? It blessed people when you see how God has blessed them. Don't envy them. And just realize, too, that all that I have, yes, you've worked hard for it. But read your Bible in Deuteronomy. It says it's not the sweat of your brow. It's not the work of your hands. It's God's blessings that has given this all to you. And it's important that we recognize that, you know, we, just because we have things doesn't mean we're spiritual. And just because we don't have things doesn't mean we're not spiritual. What's our relationship with Jesus? What's our relationship with Jesus? And I would tell our young people, I tell, we have had such great examples of young people at our church here. You know, and we have two of them here today, and Allison and Dalton. What a, I mean, and there's been other ones like a Logan and, and J.D., and they're, they're out vacationing and all this. What great examples not to wait. You know, how many times you hear people say, when I get old, I'll go to church. When I get old, I'll become a Christian. When I get old, I'll read my Bible. You know, little Tristan was eight. He never got to be old. He never got to be old. And we need to realize that what? Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Christianity isn't a bunch of, for a bunch of old people. Christianity is for those that want to live life. And I want to live. Hallelujah. You know that? I want to live. You can tell I can't dance. Hallelujah. Okay? I'm the white man with no rhythm. Okay? I'm telling you. Okay? Two left feet and everything else. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? God loves you. Why don't we stand up? You know, and, and as we get ready to receive communion, you know, I want everybody just to make sure that they're right with Jesus. Like I said, this is not about if you're officially a member of Christ the King or not. That doesn't matter in life. What matters is you're a member of the body of Christ, that you've asked Jesus into your heart. I want to give everybody that opportunity to ask Jesus into their heart. Somebody say, Pastor, I've gone to church. Pastor, I've been mad at God. I've seen other Christians and their actions don't line up with what they say. So it's kept me away from Jesus. You know what I tell people? Don't let anybody keep you away from Jesus. Those people, I don't know what's going on in their life, but don't let anybody keep you from Jesus because he said I am the way and the truth and the life and no man can come to the Father except through Jesus so you know I just want to give everybody that opportunity you might say Pastor Jeff I've never made that decision for Christ you might say I've been baptized Dalton I know I'm going to get baptized uh, after church well I'm not asking if you've been baptized I'm asking if you made Jesus the Lord of your life because baptism is is a result of your salvation, not, not trying to be saved today. Thank you, Jesus. But eyes closed and our hearts open. Anybody here say, Pastor, pray for me where I'm at? I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. Anybody today? If there's not, I'm, I'm happy for you that you're living for Jesus. I'm happy that you have Jesus in your heart. 
You know, and I'm sure there's people here. I know you're a good-looking crowd, congregation this morning, but I know people walked in this church building with hurts and broken hearts. I want you to know today we're having communion. Jesus is the healer of your broken heart. He wants to heal you right where you're at. Maybe that healing is taking place right now or maybe it's going to take place during our communion itself. Maybe on your way home. See, the earth is Jesus' operating room, not just the church building. If that's you, I just want you to reach out to Jesus and let him heal your broken heart because he doesn't want you to have a broken heart. You may say, Pastor, you don't know what I've gone through, and you're right. I don't know what you've gone through. And too many people have, have experienced things they should have never had to experience. And for that, I have empathy for you. But I tell you what, Jesus has something more than empathy for you. He has forgiveness of sins. He has healing the brokenhearted for you. Jesus wants to make you whole again. And maybe that's taking place right now in our, as we're standing in by our chairs, or maybe it's going to take place as we have communion. But I want you to know, if you would just please open up your heart to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the great physician. Let him break that chain that's keeping you from experiencing the fullness that Jesus has for you. You know, and it tells us, and the night in which Jesus betrayed, was betrayed, <clears throat> he took bread <clears throat> and he broke it. He said, take ye, eat, take ye all that eat of this. This bread represents the body that was bruised for you. And after the same manner, <clears throat> he took the cup. <clears throat> he said, this cup represents the blood that was shed for you on Calvary. That will be shed for you on Calvary for the forgiveness of your sin. I want you to know, Jesus wants you to walk out of here with a little extra hop in your step, with you not, with you knowing that Jesus loves you and nothing can come between you and him. He will break down that wall. He will unloose that chain. And I tell you what, if you don't think Jesus has the key, Jesus is the first superhero. He'll break those chains that are keeping Send your faith out to him this morning. What I'm going to ask, I'll tell you that we're, we're using glass <clears throat> little cups today, so you can't throw them away, okay? And what I'm going to just maybe ask you to do when we're finished after service, if you just come back up maybe and put, the, put them back up in here. I just know that, see, there's something special. There's something special for every one of you. Every one of you. Jesus has something unique to speak to your heart today. You know why this is a holy moment? Because Jesus is here and he's holy. Amen. But what I'm going to ask you to do is if you'll come up and take a piece of bread and then maybe you'll take your your, your cup back with you and go back to your seat. We're going to take this communion together as a congregation, okay? And we'll start with this.